Hello to my fellow food service community from my sunny Orange County, California studio. This is the Titans of Food Service. In today's episode, I welcome Charles Belillis, the founder and CEO of Suvla, a game-changing fast fine restaurant based in San Francisco. Charles comes from a family of restaurant tours and has brought a fresh perspective to the hospitality scene. Bon Appetit Magazine even dubbed him the Mark Zuckerberg of fast fine restaurants, recognizing his innovative approach to blending speed and quality. Under his leadership, Suvla has become a staple in San Francisco, earning accolades like being named a top 100 restaurant by the San Francisco Chronicle and winning the Star Chefs Award for Best Concept. Charles and Suvla have been featured in notable media outlets like the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and Forbes. Beyond Suvla, Charles is a strategic advisor to tech and food companies like Apple, Square, and Caviar, leading his expertise to the intersection of food and technology. Before launching Suvla, Charles honed his skills at renowned spots like Chef Thomas Keller's French Laundry and Bouchon Bistro, as well as Chef Michael Mina's restaurants. His educational background includes degrees in hospitality management from Cornell University and culinary arts from Johnson and Wales University. I think you're really going to enjoy our conversation. And with that, let's go ahead and welcome Charles. All right. Charles, welcome to the Titans of Food Service podcast. Appreciate you coming on here and talking with me. Uh, Nick, it is an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. Of course. Now, you're up in the Bay Area? That's correct. All right. Born and raised in California? No, sir. Uh, I'm originally from New England, uh, grew up in the greater Boston area, um, but I'm, I'm coming up on uh, spending almost half my life now in the state of California. So I don't know at what point, you know, the sort of allegiance washes away or sort of converts over, um, but I moved uh, to California in 2006. All right. Fantastic. Fantastic. So as, as I mentioned a little bit uh, off camera, I'd like to start with the fiery five food service questions. They're fun, easy icebreaker mm -hmm. questions. Are you ready? I am. If you could have dinner with any one person, either historical or alive, who would it be and why? Um, top of mind would probably be President Barack Obama. Uh, you know, I just feel like he... And quite frankly, most uh, most U.S. presidents, I think, just what what they've been able to sort of see and experience, and that job is obviously equal parts, you know, challenging and and rewarding. But just you know, anyone that has that that level of sort of exposure to just the global, you know, uh, zeitgeist, I guess, is 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 sort of high on my list. But that, for whatever reason. Um, is is the first first name to pop into my head. We had the good fortune a number of years ago um, to serve his wife, uh, the first lady, um, Suvla, on on a flight back uh, to D.C. from San Francisco. I didn't get a chance to meet her on that, um, but they uh, they've obviously been, been big big fans of the brand, um, and he just seems like a super cool guy. Okay, great answer. Great great answer. All right, question number two. If you could only have one type of cuisine for the rest of your life, what would it be? The low hanging fruit here uh, for me would be Greek cuisine. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do maintain that I could probably eat a horiatiki salata, the, the sort of traditional Greek village salad every day. Uh, I do think <laughs> it is one of those rare foods uh, or rare dishes that can be had. And quite frankly, in Greece, it's served at almost every meal. Um, okay. So, but that I feel is a little too sort of on the nose for me, obviously being Greek American and, and you know, uh, running, running these Greek restaurants. I think, I think a, a, a close second uh, would probably be Japanese cuisine, specifically sushi. I think I could probably eat some form of raw fish and rice um, every day for the rest of my life. Are there any foods or dishes that you've never had, but would like to try in the future? Great question. Any dishes that I haven't had, like in the future? I think, you know, some of those ones that are sort of live on the the extreme side of things, but are, are very sort of traditional dishes to the areas that they're from. A couple that come to mind, Haggis, in Scotland. I came close mm -hmm. one time, but I didn't actually dive in there. Um, I almost I almost had chicken tartare when I was in Tokyo um, two trips ago, but I didn't want to take the risk and have it screw up my honeymoon. Um, so I held <laughs> off there. 
Uh, and then balut, I think, would be another interesting one. Um, the Filipino dish, um, just again, more from a box check standpoint. I think the most recent thing that was a, an unusual one, I had not anticipated um, having it. It got served to me um, in an omakase meal in Tokyo in January. was apparently quite seasonal. Uh, it was deep fried cod sperm. That's uh, apparently some wow. of a delicacy in Japan. Uh, I, did not, I did not know that. Um, and it's uh, it's interesting. I don't think it's something that I need to have again. But um, and I and I had to eat my wife's uh, portion as well because she refused to eat it. So I guess I had it twice. I had it twice. So it sounds, you've traveled quite a bit, from what it sounds like. Uh, I do very much enjoy traveling. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Do you have a favorite food related memory from traveling? Is there one that stands out above the rest? Mm, great question. Um, a recent one, I took uh, members of Suvla's leadership team to Greece last year. And for many of them, it was their first time. This is a combination of the folks that, you know, everything from, you know, operations, culinary, HR, all that fun stuff. Um, and we spent time um, in Athens and Santorini. And then we were down in the Peloponnese in one of my favorite sort of little hidden zones uh, of, of that area. And we were with uh, one of our uh, wine producers because we, we have a line of uh, Greek wines. We work with three different producers in, in Greece. And we were at this, uh, one of my favorite little fish restaurants right on the water um, in the evening. And it, we happened to just catch this rainstorm and the power went out, um, which didn't really seem to uh, bother anyone at the restaurant. Um, and we had this just amazing uh, dinner with candlelight and just all this amazing, uh, fish, including my personal favorite, um, which is red mullet called barbunia, um, that they just mm -hmm. kind of lightly fry. Um, so that was definitely a big, big, big one. Okay. And my last one is if someone had one night to have dinner in the Bay area. Where must they eat? And I know it's a very large area. Um, what would you recommend? Um, yeah, no, I know that's, that's, a, that's a great question. And obviously we're going to remove our restaurants from this answer. Um, but you know, a, a personal favorite and a very important, not only an important restaurant to the city of San Francisco, but also an important restaurant to Suvla. Um, we were actually just there. Um, we celebrate, uh, we, this was our 11th visit. Um, but we, on the night before the anniversary of Suvla, which we just celebrated 10 years, two weeks ago, um, we all go, thank you. We go to a restaurant in, in the city called the house of prime rib. Now you can guess what they serve there by the name. Um, that restaurant is probably, it's gotta be 60 years old at this point. Um, mm -hmm. still one of the hardest reservations to get in the city. Uh, like Suvla, very simple streamlined menu. You basically make a, two choices, what your, what your sides are and how thick you want your prime rib. Um, but it is this just absolutely impeccable throwback restaurant that's been doing the same thing every day for 60 plus years. They serve 800 to a thousand meals a day. It's a huge restaurant packed all the time. And it is, um, just everything that you want in a restaurant. And it's also just for us, just, it's a, it's a, it's a special, special place, um, that we obviously celebrate, you know, every year for Suvla. And it just, I mean, who doesn't want just a thick slice of prime rib and, mashed potatoes and cream spinach and all that fun stuff. Oh, of course, man. That, that, that just sounds good. How did you get into the restaurant business? Um, you could say that this was sort of hereditary, I guess. Um, yeah. my, um, my grandfather, my father's father ran restaurants and also taught the culinary arts, um, in the greater Boston area. Um, in the, you know, starting in the fifties through the, through the early to actually late seventies, um, it skipped. And then my mother's father who came to the U S from Greece was just one of those naturally talented cooks, never did it um, professionally, but you know, the guy never had Chinese food until he came to the U S had Chinese food from the, the place down the street from where he moved to. And like the next day he's like figured out, he's like nailed their lo mein recipe somehow. Um, it skipped my parents' generation from a culinary standpoint, but both of them are 
um, entrepreneurs, small business owners. Um, mm-hmm. So, so there is that part of it. And uh, being Greek American, you know, like like so many other cultures, most things kind of revolved around food. Mm-hmm. Um, my first words as a my first complete sentence as a human was actually um, ordering lunch at a restaurant. Wow. Um, yeah. Uh, hamburger, <laughs> french fries, lemonade. Yeah, when the when the when the server came up. So I, there was just a lot of these things, sort of like the universe, sort of conspiring to just to to, to make this sort of happen for me. I, when I graduated college, I, I actually didn't want anything to do with uh, cooking um, or restaurants. Um, I had started to pursue a, a degree in like natural resources and outdoor mm-hmm. sort of recreation and sort of stuff like that. I was I was a big mountain biker many years ago. And, you know, halfway through my first year of college, the light bulb kind of went off as I was cooking dinner for a bunch of friends over New Year's and just like, why am I not doing this? This is what I love to do. And so that started a path that led to culinary school, that led to the hotel restaurant school, that led to working in all these great restaurants that ultimately led to me opening um, my own spot 10 years ago. Yeah, I was looking through your... um... Your history, you've worked at some very high-end restaurants before, some Thomas Keller properties. What was the experience like working, you maybe some of the lessons you learned through that process? Yeah. Um, I moved to California in 2006, as I made mention earlier, um, to go work at, at the French Laundry. Yeah. And I was, uh, I was Thomas Keller's very first culinary assistant. Wow. Um, so this was a role that didn't exist previously that I got to create um, that still exists to this day. Um, some 18 years later. Um, and it was a very unique role because it required someone that had an understanding of kitchens and restaurants operationally. And uh, up till that point, that's what I was doing. I was just cooking. Um, but also someone that, you know, had the wherewithal um, to, you know, knew how to use a computer and Excel spreadsheets and all that fun stuff. And I, I had just gotten a um, bachelor's degree from the hotel school at, at Cornell. So I, I had some some training in that realm too. Um you know, I think the biggest takeaways from that time were obviously, number one, you learn what it takes <clears throat> to operate at such a high level. You know, sure. when, when I started there, um, this was before Michelin, but what, during my time there, you know, the restaurant ultimately got three stars. Um, so it was, a, it was a privilege and an honor to be a part of that and a part of a team that, that, that got, you know, that restaurant, you know, that accolade that it still maintains. Um, it was also just very interesting working directly for Thomas because you had to you had to be a couple of steps ahead of him um, at all times. Um, so you ultimately learn to sort of think uh, like he does to to notice the things that he notices uh, and have an answer ready for it. And you're talking about obviously a very very driven, um, very very detail, uh, you know, focused individual. Um, so, you know, that was incredible, you know, incredible training for me there. I think the other big takeaway was, you know, learning to or or learning to kind of operate and treat the restaurant as if it was your own. I'm obviously, you know, yeah. I don't own the French Laundry. I'm not an investor or any of that stuff. But you but you you start to kind of approach your work and approach the day to day and think about it. If, if this was my restaurant, what would I do? And he, and it's, it's was sort of his line. I think it was referenced in one of Michael Ruman's books, but it's the, and it's something that's very simple, but if you're walking, you know, in front of the restaurant and you notice a cigarette butt or a piece of trash on the ground, you know, do you stop and pick that up, you know, Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, so many don't because it's like, yeah, this isn't my thing. This isn't my place. You know, why would I, why would I stop and do that? But it's like, if this is your restaurant, if this is your place, like there's a, there's a pride um, in the, in the appearance, um, you know, of, of that property and you would take the time to stop and do that. So a a very sort of simple lesson, but it's, but it is one of those things that so often gets, gets overlooked. And I think is, I think is paramount for anyone, um, that's pursuing a path, um, in the, in the hospitality space. And certainly that has a, a, a desire or an interest, um, to do it, uh, on their own, uh, because you want to ultimately, train um, and or sort of motivate those that work for you to to model that type of behavior because there's a point in time you know obviously I have, I have six restaurants um, all operating right now uh, and open and I'm talking here with you and and the and the hope the expectation is that is that all of the folks that run those restaurants um, 
you know, think in a, in a, in a similar manner and act in a similar manner. Did you know Nicholas Fanucci? I didn't know Nicholas Fanucci. He was the general manager at French Laundry when I was there. Yeah. I've had him on the podcast, uh, last year and talked oh, about his experience there and working with Thomas Keller. And now he owns his own, uh, cafe here in, in Malibu with his sons. Mm. Um, very interesting guy, you know, really nice guy. And, sure. um, he's, like yourself, I think, he, you know, he took a lot of lessons away from working with Thomas Keller and that whole experience. I mean, the French laundry, it's, it's a famous restaurant for sure. Of course. Of course. So when it came to starting Suvla, what was kind of the impetus to, to to start that company? Why did why was the timing when you started ten years? Why then? Hmm. It's so there's the, there's the Suvla origin story, but I think what you're referring to is kind of almost like the backstory that you know, how how did the the lead up to that moment, and it, and it really yes. comes down to it really comes down to kind of a um, somewhat of like a a, a poignant moment. I had worked for Thomas Keller for a number of years. I went, I moved to the city. I moved from Napa Valley down to, down to San Francisco to work, to go work for Michael Mina, uh, another obviously highly accomplished chef with, with yes. many, many restaurants, uh, great organization. Um, and, you know, including, you know, uh, more of the sort of higher end fine dining sort of Michelin star varietals. You know, these restaurant groups and these restaurants, especially when you're operating full service fine dining restaurants, they require just an awful lot of effort um, and obviously a big team, but just a, an incredible amount of dedication and buy in and just you know hard work. And those environments can be um, in, in both ways. Uh, intoxicating in both a positive manner because you're surrounded by all this all this incredible talent and great energy and this sort of drive to to sort of showcase you know extraordinary food and wine um, but on the flip side you know there's a there's a, a somewhat of a human toll in terms of just the sheer amount of you know hours um and and commitment and basically you know the majority of your sort of life uh, in that in, in in that in that time sort of gets focused on on this job um, that ultimately, you know, is for, you know, an, uh, employer, um, and you don't, you, you know, this isn't yours, you know, you're not a, you're not a partner, you're not an investor, um, mm -hmm. you're an employee and, um, that can, that can be challenging, um, for people with respect to their, just their lives outside of work. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, I had sort of hit a point, you know, almost about a decade or so in of just no vacations, no time off, you know, um, a lot of that stuff. And it just, and it, and it starts to kind of, um, wear you down a little bit. And I sort of hit a moment, I, I sort of hit a moment in that journey where, where it was kind of, I stopped and sort of thought, it's like, if I'm going to continue to do this, and I, I love working for both of those places, but, it, but it's like, if I'm going to continue to do this and I'm going to continue to work. 70, 80, 90 hours a week, and I'm going to make these restaurants my priority in life. Um, I need to start doing it for myself. And so that was kind of the big turning point because I didn't mind the, the, the nature of the work. I didn't mind the hours. I was certainly used to it. Um, but I, and, and, and while I was, you know, receiving great benefit in the form of training and experience, um, ultimately, uh, you know, I wasn't sort of personally benefiting. Um, mm -hmm. and so that started the path of, you know, thinking about what I wanted to do. I had always for, for since, you know, since being, since starting in culinary school, there was always a desire to do my own thing. Um, uh, but I didn't really know what it was. And I also wanted to experience as much as I possibly could in all of the disciplines in the restaurant industry. So that's mm -hmm. why I started, you know, line cook, sous chef, you know, back office, uh, dining room manager, sommelier, sort of everything in between. Um, I wanted to kind of round out um, my time in restaurants to best prepare me um, for, for doing my own thing. And, you know, that's always the, the advice that I give, you know, young folks that, that have an interest in, in starting their own, you know, restaurant or whatever it is, is, is go out and work for the absolute best people that you possibly can learn as much 
from them as you possibly can, um, you know, be able to uh, experiment and sort of screw up and, and, and learn from your mistakes on, on someone else's dime, you know, um, and, and those are, those are a lot of things that will best prepare you for, for your own path in um, entrepreneurship. Yeah, I feel that I, uh, I got into the food business about nine years ago and, uh, own a, uh, food service brokerage company. So we represent different products and mm-hmm. go to restaurants like, like yourself and present products. And then if you're interested, you can buy it through Cisco or us, whoever the distributor is. And, um, my dad was actually the one that got me into this business. And, uh, without him, I, I mean, he, he had built his career in, as a food service broker. And so his mm-hmm. tutelage and, and learning under him and, um, it was invaluable to learn those lessons, uh, from him. And, uh, I, I, I tell people the same thing, like find somebody that has been there, done that, or, or someone you aspire to be, or has done things that you, you, that you'd like to do in the future and just follow what, you know, their lessons and, and guidance. And, uh, sometimes it can, it'll push you much further ahead in life than just doing it yourself and kind of slowly going at it. Um, sure. you know, it's important to surround yourself with people that are, yeah, where you want to be. Mm-hmm. I agree. I agree. If you, if you, um, if you look back on the 10 years that you've been in business now, is there anything that you would do differently? Uh, if you were to start all over again, would you do anything differently, um, a second time around? Great question. Uh, you know, I think the, I think the only real thing that I would, I, we're obviously going to remove like the pandemic from, from the answer. Of course. I would prefer to not, I, I prefer to do that differently. Not, I, I'm actually very proud of how we handled the, the, the yeah. pandemic, but I would like to have not have gone through that process if I. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, no, I think, I think that, I think that it's something where um, I would probably structure some of the Suvla investment a little bit differently. We've, 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 we were very, very fortunate to you know have a small group of of uh, individual investors um, early on that have been great supporters and so of our six restaurants three of them are our investor back and three of them are actually um, we've done on our own um, and so I would probably you know and and everyone has done quite well with that I think if anything I would I would try to structure something a little bit differently where we could have um, you know owned sort of more of our restaurants sooner mm-hmm. on. Um, so I'd say I'm, I'm obviously quite grateful for, for those that, that took a risk on me and on Suvla in the early days. And, you know, I'm happy that you know, everyone has done well in that, in that endeavor, uh, cause that's not always the case with, with restaurant investing. I do a little bit of mm-hmm. restaurant investing myself nowadays, and it's, it's interesting sort of being on the other side of that. Um, I would also probably on a related note, um, and it's very difficult in San Francisco, it certainly was, it's gotten a little easier, but, um, I would always try to try to encourage people to try and own the real estate. Um, being in San Francisco, um, five of our six restaurants are in, are in San Francisco. Buying buildings is not um, an easy or inexpensive uh, endeavor, um, but it does, you know, create for a more stable investment. And also just you have a lot bigger downside protection um, mm-hmm. in some of those things. So I would say probably, you know, uh, probably some tweaks to the investment structure and then probably the ability to, to own own the real estate. Uh, Cause when you think about how many hundreds of hundreds of thousands of dollars we spend annually on rent, you know, um, ha- having that going towards an asset um, that will appreciate over time. And certainly when you think about how much money, how many millions of dollars we've pumped into improving other people's buildings, um, you know, that would be, that would be a big thing for us um, that if I could wave a magic wand, I would probably figure out how to change. When it comes to restaurant invest, investment investing, is there kind of a blueprint that a lot of restaurants use in terms of you know deal structure? I'm familiar with deal structure around like multifamily, uh, mm-hmm. uh, like apartment complexes, but with restaurants, sure. is there how does that usually look? Um, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, there's no right or wrong way. I think everyone does yeah. things a little bit differently. The, the The deal structure that we used in the early days. Um, that I still remain, you know, a big fan of uh, is and, and certainly encourage others um, to at least look at as a structure is we 
we structured our early investments on what's called the preferred return Mm -hmm. um, structure. And basically uh, investors who are obviously taking, especially for a, for a a new concept, a new operator taking quite a big risk. um, The way that we structured ours was investors, uh, you know, preferred members, which were investors, um, uh, received 90% of available profit until they were paid back 120% of their original investment. Wow. So you're putting investors first, right? Which obviously makes the investor happy, right? They're able to recoup their, their capital quicker. Um, mm-hmm. But you're also incentivizing the operator, the principal, to run um, as lean and mean and profitable as an operation as possible in the early days. Um, because the equity split doesn't revert back to sort of the, the, the traditional um, until everyone has reached that, that, that payback um, period or sort of you know, thing. So round numbers, right? I sell off 25% of you know, my, my restaurant to raise you know, the million dollars or whatever it is. Um, you know, I'm incentivized to pay, to repay that million or 1.2 million, um, back, right. As soon as I can, because the, because the equity split during that payback period is now 90, 10, you know, and not 75, 25 and, or 25, 75, you know? So what, what's, what's useful there is obviously you learn, you know, you, you really dig in, you know, I was the only sal- salaried employee and open and closed the first Suvla for most of the first year. But what that what that ultimately ended up doing is we paid our investors back in one year, right? And that's so fast. now, and yeah, it's fast, right? And that's and that's partially because of that of that structure. And what that what that allowed me to do is get to a point where, and obviously Suvla was always intended to be scaled, um, but it took two years for me to raise $450,000 to build the first Suvla. Mm-hmm. It took me eight days to raise a million dollars to build the second one. It went from a huge struggle for me raising capital to people being like, why, why, like, why can't I get more, you know, of this? Um, and so that's the other sort of positive, you know, to it. Um, so especially for, for, you know, new concepts, new operators where there's obviously considerable risk, um, I, I tend to encourage people to sort of, um, embody that, uh, that, that structure just because it, it, I, I think it ultimately is a win-win. You could, you could say that there's a drawback for the operator because they're just sort of giving up this equity in the, mm-hmm. in the short term, but I think it does pay back in the long term. And I think the, the last part of it too, and this was the other reason why we put it in place, obviously being in the Bay area, there's quite a lot of, you know, venture and private equity and, and, you know, tech companies and everything like that. So the first thing, especially if you're, if you're pitching, you know, somewhat of an uh, experienced um, investor is they're going to look at your deal structure and they're going to immediately place a valuation on this enterprise, right? Mm-hmm. Just based off of how much money you're raising and how much equity you're giving up. And the reality is, especially for restaurants, you have no idea what this thing is really worth, especially before you open the doors and have any form of revenue or anything like that. It gets a lot easier to value a restaurant, you know, after a few years and you have, you can kind of employ industry um, standard multiples, whether it's for revenue or EBITDA or anything like that. But prior to opening the doors, you know, people, you know, people were like, well, you're, oh, so you think this is a $2 million restaurant? It's like, I don't know what this restaurant is, you know? And so by using the preferred return method, it kind of puts, it's kind of throws valuation out the window because you kind of can't value this any, you know, anymore. Um, so that's the other reason why, why, why I prefer it. <clears throat> For the investors, do you run the, the locations or do they have to um, run the locations? Um, I'm not sure the question here. So, so uh, investors investors invest in, in an individual Suvla location, um, but they do, so they, they, do, they have no they have no investors. operational they have no operational um, say in anything. So this is not okay, know, gotcha. Suvla is yeah exactly. This is a pure investment um, situation. We have a um, so we own and operate all of our restaurants. Investors that have invested or just have a have a passive interest in it. Okay, that makes sense. Looking far into the distance, into the future, what is something that you want to achieve that you've not yet achieved? 
Good question. I was going to say put Suvla in the air, but we did do that a couple of years ago. Um, we helped Delta Airlines uh, relaunch their hot food program. This was the first time that Greek cuisine had been flown ab- aboard a major domestic air carrier. It was a, it was a lot of fun. Very, very difficult wow. business, but a um, yeah. ton of fun. Um, no, I think I think ultimately it's it's about bringing Suvla to more people and, and more cities. And um, we were sort of gearing up to do New York at the beginning of 2020, and we kind of know how that year and subsequent years played out. Um, and we've sort of we've sort of reverted back to just kind of focusing on on um, Northern California and then hopefully Southern California um, in the next few years. Um, you know, we don't have any institutional capital behind us. Um, so mm-hmm. there's no private equity, there's no venture, we don't franchise, we don't do any of that stuff. So it does, um, you know, I think, I think the, the con there is that it, it obviously heavily restricts how quickly we grow. Um, the pro is that, is that we just have full control over everything and we, um, are very, very thoughtful about how we grow, about where we go, uh, about what these projects look like. And so it does mm-hmm. slow down the the overall sort of time frame, um, but it does prevent, you know, the the, the sort of, st- or hopefully prevents the, the story that we see play out so often of, of these other restaurant brands that take on these, you know, big capital partners, whether it's, you know, and there's nothing wrong with private equity or venture capital or any of that stuff, mm-hmm. but, you know, they, 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 they get the headline and they raise tens of millions of, do- of, of dollars or hundreds of millions of dollars to grow and you start growing really fast and, and things can kind of go sideways very, very quickly. Restaurants, um, restaurants don't scale like, you know, a, a piece of software or a widget or things like that. These are incredibly people intensive businesses. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, you need to have a, and I'm fortunate I have an incredible team behind me. Um, but with that and with growth, it's like, you've got to be really, really thoughtful about how you do it, where you go, who's, who's operating it, all of those things, because, because the, the consumer, um, and we're very, very fortunate. We have a, a just a wonderful group of customers that have a fierce loyalty to, to the brand and a, and, a, and a real passion behind it, which is phenomenal to see. Um, so we just want to be careful and make sure that we're, you know, not picking, you know, picking the right real estate and or, you know, not going to a place that we shouldn't go or in a, in a format that might not be the right fit. You know, um, a lot of people do a lot of deals with with third party sort of licensing that can be can be very, very beneficial from a growth standpoint. Um, but a lot of it just comes down to who you're working with. So it's, it's a lot of those things, but so that's a very long way of answering your question of, of, you know, the goal is, you know, I would like to see Suvla in, you know, in other major cities across the, the, the United States. Fantastic. Well, Charles, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and sharing your story and, and a little bit more about Suvla. I've really enjoyed our conversation. So thank you. Thank you, Nick. This was great. Yeah, we'll have to do it again. Thanks, man. All right, yeah.